right. Well, today you're going to learn a little self-control, I hope. <laughs> but I do have to say I'm pretty surprised for a uh, time change Sunday where we're springing ahead, losing an hour. So many of you guys showed up on time. Yeah. That's pretty great. Well, why don't we stand together and open our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and that you reveal in your word more of yourself, your heart for us. Lord, we pray that we would understand these two verses that have so much packed into them today, Lord, that you would strengthen us in our relationship with you, our resolve to follow you through all things. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. How many of you guys have ever seen the TV show Undercover Boss? Have you ever seen that before? That's great. It's a pretty fun show. Now what happens is a CEO of a major corporation will go undercover and they'll show up one day um, working with the rank and file employees, those uh, that do the menial jobs for the company and spend time learning how to do their jobs. And it's really actually kind of funny how you see the boss learn how to flip burgers and get yelled at by one of the managers. And then they'll do these little interviews with the managers. And you'll, you'll hear the manager say things like this, I don't think he's going to cut it. You know, he just doesn't have what it takes to work in this business. And so, you know, you know as the viewer, this is the boss. And so it's really an amazing thing to watch a boss step down and work with those employees. Now, at the end of the show, something great happens, and that is, by the end, that boss understands the difficulties of his managers, of the workers, and having done their job, experienced the, the rush, the hurry, the, the, the strength that it takes, the concentration, and so he has a new understanding for his employees. Oftentimes, they make sweeping changes for their company, benefiting the employees, but one of the best part is picking those employees that did an amazing job. And then he'll meet with them at the end and find out that maybe somebody's sister has got cancer and they're working hard to help support the sister. And so the boss will say, here's $50,000 for you and your family. And you know, it's a real touching moment at that time. But undercover boss. Now, I like that show a lot because it reminds me of what Jesus Christ did for us. God became a man. He was an undercover God and walked among us. And not only did he walk among us, but he experienced what it was like to be one of us. It wasn't like he was separated or insulated from the pain, the suffering, the difficulties, going through puberty, learning how to listen to your mother, um, you know, all those things. He experienced it all. And so that's what we find here as we're looking at Mark's account of the temptation of Jesus Christ. You may have noticed something a little different in Mark's account. And that is that it's very short. There's not a lot of information about the actual temptation. And so it begs the question, why is Mark's account so different from Mark's, or I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke's? If you were to read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, or Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, you see the accounts of his temptation in great detail. 
Now there's not different information, it's just less information. Mark focuses on something that I think is really important. After studying this for a while, it finally stood out to me what Mark's uh, vision was for uh, writing these two verses for us, and that is to present Christ as a God who identifies with man and experiences our weakness. And so you'll see that as we study through it that we see that God identifies with our weaknesses. So it was not enough for God to know you. It wasn't enough for God to know that He needed to save you. He actually became one of us. And so the first point that we're looking at today is this. He was tempted in order to sympathize with the weakness of our flesh. Okay? He was tempted in order to sympathize with us with the weakness of our flesh. Now, as we look into these verses, it starts off with the person of the Godhead that we saw during the baptism of Jesus Christ. As he was baptized and came up out of the water, he saw heavens open and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and rested upon him. This same Spirit at that time asked him or moved him forward into something new. Before his main ministry began, there was something important that Jesus needed to undergo. Not only his baptism, his official commissioning by the Father and empowerment to the Holy Spirit, but also his identification with us in a way that was very intimate. Where he knows you and experiences what you experience. And so the Spirit, the one that came upon him at the baptism, that empowered him for the ministry, now leads him. But notice that word, after the Spirit, immediately. Again, in the book of Mark, Mark brings up that word 42 times. Immediately. He does this, then immediately that happens. So right after Christ was baptized, the Spirit it says, right away. He didn't like go home. He didn't go stay in a hotel for a night and freshen up. Immediately, it says the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. Anybody notice the forcefulness of that phrase? Drove him out. Maybe it reminds you of Genesis chapter 3 where God drove Adam out of the garden. Remember that? This word to drive out is actually used like 17 times in Mark's Gospel, and the majority of those times it's used of casting out demons. So it's not just ascending. That's not strong enough of a phrase. The Spirit drove him out, impelled him forward into, remember last week we talked about the eagle stirring up the nest and forcing the eaglet to jump out of that nest and experience a, a, a new role. And that's what we see here. The Spirit is stirring up the nest and sending Christ out to the next level toward that ministry that God called him to. Kind of a strange thing to see a, a, the Holy Spirit whose picture is as a dove <laughs> then drive him out. <coughs> See, the Father wants Jesus to experience the weakness of our flesh through temptation. And that's why he's driving him out further into the wilderness. And remember, Jesus was already in the wilderness when he met with John. It was next to the Jordan River. But here, the Spirit drives him out further, farther away. Sometimes we experience temptation or testing or difficulties in life and we get a little upset with God because we think God is like a gentle dove. God, why are you doing this to me? There must be something wrong with me or um, there must be something wrong with God because I'm going through these hard times and I don't understand why. I feel like I'm in the wilderness. But understand, the Holy Spirit leads us at times into difficulty 
into the wilderness experience because he's doing something great in our life. It's not too unlike a father teaching his child to ride a bike. And in that moment, when the father lets go and that child begins to pedal on their own, and then they realize they're on their own. You ever notice that? That yeah. quick look back over the shoulder. And then when they realize they're on their own, they're like, oh, you know. <laughs> you know. And then mom comes out. Child screaming. Why'd you do this to my son? You know, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but that's actually a loving action of a father to teach his child to ride the bike. Because imagine that child growing up, 21 years old, with training wheels. Imagine how unloving that would be for a father to let his child grow up like that. And imagine what the guys would say. You know, our father knows what he's doing, our heavenly father. And the spirit leads Jesus out um, for something good, even though it seems on the surface like something not so good. The spirit is still trustworthy when you don't understand what he's doing. As Jesus enters into the, into the wilderness, I think it's really important to understand at this point that for the Jewish mindset during that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was widely accepted and understood among the Jews that the wilderness was a haunt for demons. It was a place where evil spirits resided. Danger difficulties. It was scary. And so Christ enters into the wilderness. If there's a Jew reading this letter, they're thinking, oh my, the wilderness. That's not such a fun place. And Christ enters that wilderness, we see here for 40 days. 40 days. That might sound familiar. 40 days happens a lot in Scripture. But there's one in particular instance in the Old Testament that I want to bring out to your attention, and that is the 40 days that Moses spent on Mount Sinai. 40 days. Now Moses, if you have understood the Old Testament and studied it, Moses is like a picture or a pre-type of Jesus Christ. Moses is the deliverer of the people of Israel. And Jesus comes as the ultimate deliverer of the people of Israel. Moses went up to Mount Sinai to bring down the word of God on stone tablets. Jesus arrives as the word of God manifests in human flesh. These 40 days that Moses spent on Mount Sinai, he spent without food or water. And actually he did it twice. The first time when he got the first tablets and came down and found the people sitting, remember what he did? He threw them down. You broke God's commandments. And as a prophet, you know, it was a physical, visible experience of what it looks like to break God's commands. And then he goes back up for another 40 days to bring down the second copy on stone. And so both times that he brought down the commandments, he spent 40 days before that happened. Before Jesus comes to the people as the word of God made manifest, he spends 40 days in the wilderness without food or water. Just like Moses. But Christ experiences something much more intense than Moses ever did. And that was this personal temptation by Satan. At a time when he was at his weakest, at a time when he hadn't eaten for 40 days, when he brought his human flesh to the edge of its ability to survive, that's when Satan shows up and begins tempting Jesus Christ. And notice that. It says that he was tempted by Satan. There's another time in Genesis where Satan tempts a perfect person. And that is in the Garden of Eden. With the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the fruit of that tree, he, he tempted Eve to 
partake of it, and then she took it and gave it to Adam, who partook of it. The first Adam failed miserably, and we're all suffering because of it. Jesus Christ comes as a better and new um, Adam, who is also perfect, without sin, and yet when he faces the temptation, he does not sin. And so now, he can provide for us, because of his not sinning through the temptation, can provide for us life, eternal. The first Adam brought death through his sin. The second Adam brings life through his obedience and his death on the cross. So he runs into Satan. Now in the book of Genesis, we know Satan was not an ugly creature. We find actually Satan was one of the most beautiful of God's creation. And even today, if you ran into Satan, um, you would not see a guy in a red uh, tight suit with a tail and a pitchfork. That was an image created in the Middle Ages to poke fun at Satan. But what you would rather see is an angel of light. The New Testament tells us that he... He hides himself. He disguises himself as an angel of light. And so I would imagine when Satan shows up to tempt Christ, he shows up as this beautiful being. As Jesus is weak and tired, he shows up as healthy and strong. The word Satan actually means adversary. So think back. The Spirit drove Christ out to face his enemy in the desert, in the wilderness. Now there's another name for Satan we find in the Bible. It's the devil. And that name means accuser. So if you um, slander somebody, that verb form in the Greek is the word where we get the noun Satan from. He's the slanderer. Or I'm sorry, we get the noun devil from. He's the slanderer. And so what he will do in the lives of believers is slander you. How, how can you be holy? Look what you just thought. You know, look what you just did. And he will slander you before God. Accuse you before your Father in heaven. But it also says there that not only was Jesus there with Satan tempting him, but also there was another group of beings. There were the wild animals. The wild animals. And every time I uh, spend time with the Lord in the morning, I, I get my Bible, my coffee. I have to wait for that to brew first. <laughs> and then I sit down with my Bible and my coffee, and soon enough, or sure enough, every morning, I get my two visitors. Sadie and Lavinia, my dogs. The beasts come and hang out with their master. <laughs> I spend time with the, the animals. Now, that is not the picture here. <laughs> or maybe in your mind you're thinking of Snow White. And Jesus is walking through the wilderness and little birds are talking to him and, and he's singing to them and things. That's not the picture here. <laughs> Remember, the picture is one of weakness, facing an enemy, and being in danger. He's in the wilderness, and, and he's surrounded by these animals. This is not yet the millennial reign of Christ, where the infant can play over the hole of the adder. And the lion lays down with the lamb. It's not that time yet. So Christ is out in the wilderness, and these animals are dangerous. Anybody who goes out into the wilderness, even in our area, knows that there are mountain lions and bears and all sorts of things. You know, you just got to be careful of. A little less, it seems, predators here than in other parts of the world. Like the Middle East, like the jungle, or in Africa. And so, there was an understood fear. If you're by yourself, you have no way to protect yourself and there are wild animals running loose, you are vulnerable. And so Christ puts himself in a place that is vulnerable. 
And he's vulnerable to the point where lesser beings called angels, remember, Jesus is the Son of God. And so angels, lesser beings, show up to minister to him. Or it's that word serve in the New Testament. Quite possibly they brought him at the end of this temptation the strength, the sustenance in the form of food and took care of his needs at that moment and strengthened him. So our God was brought to the utter brink of his physical ability on the, when he was in the body on the face of this earth. He understands what it means not only to be weak and to feel pain, but also to undergo temptation. You see, knowledge of the fact that you go through temptation was not enough. He was sent to sympathize and experience that same sort of temptation that you undergo on a daily basis. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Christ is able to not only sympathize with your weakness, but notice, he was tempted in every respect that you are tempted. Now, if you were to go into uh, Matthew and Luke and look at the accounts of Jesus' temptation, we see the three areas that he was tempted in that are the classic three areas um, that we're all tempted in, no matter what type of temptation. In 1 John, it's laid out for us, and we see, I think Jordan just taught on this to the kids. I know one of my, uh, where are you at, Jordan? Okay, there you are. I can't see because one of my contacts are out. <laughs> so Jordan was just teaching this, and I asked one of my, my kids, Austin, hey, what did Jordan teach on? And he, he laid it out. It's really great. But 1 John, chapter 2, verse 16, we see that there is the desire of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so those three things being the areas Jesus was tempted in with turning a stone into bread, the desires of the flesh, with seeing all the kingdoms of the world and uh, being tempted to desire them, the lust of the eyes. And then being tempted to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple and have angels catch him the pride of life. Every way that you're tempted in, in every sphere of your being that you're tempted in, Christ has experienced those temptations. Now there is a common misconception out there, and when we're going through temptation, that is to believe that you are the only one being tempted in the way that you're being tempted. That you're all alone. That you must be so vile, so screwed up, that you're the only one that is thinking these thoughts or who has been tempted with these desires that you're being tempted with. But the reality is, no temptation that you experience is unique. Every temptation you experience is common to man. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's common to man. So, before you get defeated, by thinking that you are vile anyway, you might as well commit the sin that you're being tempted with. Um, don't get deceived. Realize your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same sorts of trials and temptations. You don't stand alone. Not only do you not stand alone among your brothers and sisters in Christ, but you do not stand alone when it comes to uh, your relationship with God. He knows. He understands. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus was tempted with the internet. Um, it wasn't around back then. Al Gore hadn't been born. So. <laughs> but the same sort of sin, right? He knows what it feels like, you guys. And so look at verse 16 of Hebrews 4. 
uh, we go on from that reality that he's our great high priest that can sympathize with us, that it's been tempted in every way, but he did not sin in that temptation. And that's a great truth because sometimes we think we have to find somebody that has fallen in an area of a temptation we have in order to understand it and overcome it. We say, okay, I, I can't talk to the pastor because the pastor has never uh, done meth. Not true. I mean, you can't talk to me. <laughs> I was got myself I, I, True, I have never done meth, but you can talk to me. Why? You know, because I've been tempted in all the basic ways you have. And you have a Savior that understands you. And so the enemy is going to use that. He's going to isolate you. I mean, what's the first thing you do to pick off uh, some sheep? You try to isolate one. Get the stragglers. Get the ones that decide they want to go off by themselves. And you know, there's strength in numbers, though. We gather together, we strengthen one another, and yeah, I may not have done the same things as you, but I struggle with sin just like you. Wouldn't you rather hear from somebody that was victorious over sin than from somebody who's always conquered by it? And we have that person. His name is Jesus. And so we can bring those temptations to him. We can bring our struggles to him, and he understands them completely. And therefore, in verse 16 of Hebrews 4, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And how many times have we isolated that verse from the context of Jesus understanding our struggles? But when we put it in that context, doesn't that change maybe the way that you think of your relationship with God? Because sometimes, because you've been tempted, maybe granted you haven't sinned, but you've been tempted, you feel dirty. And you feel unworthy to enter the presence of God. But this verse gives us that confidence that says, you know, when you enter the presence of God with Jesus Christ as your Lord, you can enter with confidence. And He'll give you mercy if you've sinned. He will give you Grace to overcome. So don't let temptation and sin shame you away from God. That's exactly what Satan would like to see in your life. Isolation, separation, running away even further. But what we find with the fact that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses is an understanding God. He can sympathize with you. It's better than an AA meeting. It's better than a counseling session. And all those things might be helpful. This is something available to all of us, and there's much more power in our deliverance through Jesus Christ than any of those things. So, Mark's focus, Christ's weakness, his sympathizing with us. But that brings us to the second point. He was victorious that we might experience the strength of His Spirit. Did you catch that? He was victorious that we might experience the strength of His Spirit. So for us, it's knowing is not enough, right? For us, we experience the victory. We not only know Jesus was victorious and makes us uh, more than conquerors, but we will experience that through Him. And so in the same way He stepped down to become a man to experience what you experience, we, through Jesus Christ, partake in the divine nature, it says in Peter's epistle, through the Spirit of God. And we get to experience and walk in that victory. Through Jesus. And so, in order to understand this, I want to start with Jesus' temptations, and I've already kind of covered them for you. The first one was what? You remember? Turn the stone into bread. Turn the stone into bread. That's right. Okay, so let's think about that in our mind. We go to that temptation of Christ. He was hungry. It's one of the uh, great understatements in the Bible. 
<laughs> he hadn't eaten for 40 days and he was hungry. And so Satan said, change the stone into bread. And Jesus responded with the word of God. Yep. The word of God. And he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's great. He answers the issue with the word of God, with a verse talking about the word of God. Go back to the 40 days scenario. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. God provided manna every single day up to the very day that they entered the promised land. God provided food. But that verse that Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 points that out that Man does not live by bread alone or by man alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's God's word that sustains us and feeds us. And so Christ, notice what he's doing. He's putting his physical needs aside and saying his spiritual needs are more important. To be fed by the word of God. Now, the second temptation, and I'm going by Luke's order because Matthew and Luke have it switched a little bit. Luke says that the next temptation is when Jesus takes him to a hilltop and in an instant he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and he offers him something. He says, if you bow and worship me, I will give you that messianic kingdom right now. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to experience pain. There's no sacrifice involved. I will give you all the kingdoms. Just bow and worship me. Do you think you'd be tempted? Instant gratification. How many of you guys have been tempted by instant gratification? <laughs> you want it now. You know? Instead of putting it on layaway, stick it on a credit card. Too bad they don't do layaway so much these days. Instant gratification. Jesus had the option of instant gratification. If only he would bow the knee to Satan. But Christ responded by saying, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, he said, It is written. He responded with the word of God. And then the third temptation. Jesus took him to the pinnacle of the temple. Most likely that southeast corner of the temple that was over the Kidron Valley. So as you looked behind you, you could see all Jerusalem. As you looked the other way, you could see all the surrounding land for miles in every direction. And from that pinnacle, Satan said, just throw yourself off. And the angels will pick you up. And he actually quoted a Bible verse uh, from one of the Psalms and said, see, the word says that this will happen. But then Jesus responded with a verse actually in context and said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so Satan left Christ. Jesus did not give in to the temptation. He had the word of God as a tool to combat that temptation. You know the Bible in Ephesians 6.17 is called the sword of the spirit. We have an offensive weapon in this battle against the enemy and that's the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Now remember, as we think about those instances of the 40 days with Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, it dealt with the word of God, right? He brought the word. The 40 years in the desert dealt with the word of God. God said, all this was to learn or to teach you and that you would know man does not live on bread alone but by every word it proceeds from the mouth of God. It makes sense here. The word of God is a great key in our sustenance spiritually in overcoming temptation. And many of you guys have heard 
these messages before on the temptation of Christ and using the Word of God to combat the uh, lies of the enemy as well as um, overcome temptation. But I want to challenge you with a thought. Because how many of us actually know that yet still fall to those temptations every day? Thinking that, you know, with a Bible verse, if I quote it, I'm going to overcome the temptation. Maybe. But there's another element here involved in the quoting of the Bible verse. Um, you can quote the Bible all you want and still do the wrong thing. It happens. We see this and it breaks our hearts when even pastors that teach the Word are up here every Sunday teaching the Word and then you hear about them falling into sin. How is that possible? They know the Bible backwards and forwards and they quote the verses all the time. You know, I think of some, some guys that maybe they made um, crusading against homosexuality their thing. And what's the sin they fall into? Homosexuality. How is that possible? Well, I want to bring your attention to something, and that is that before we have the Spirit of God, the commands of God cause our sinful nature to want to break them. And I'll tell you where it's at in the Bible. In Romans 7, 7. Check this out. Paul's making this argument. He's trying to make this point. Without the Spirit of God, um, the commands of God make you want to break them. It says, What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet, here it is, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. How is that possible? Well, it's human nature. If somebody says, don't do something, what do you want to do? Do it. We're kind of rebels, without a cause, from the time we're born. The flesh, our sinful nature is that way. And sometimes we can't help it. Don't, whatever you do right now, by any circumstance, think of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> just don't do it. If you do it, you know, you're just weak. Now, I mean, that's sinful nature, right? We tend to do the things. We think about the things we're not supposed to do. But uh, I, I do want to end with uh, this portion of Romans 7. In verse 11, it says, For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy. Don't get me wrong. The law, the word of God is holy, powerful, living and active. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. But it's the sin in us that caused us to break it. So again, pointing out the reality that sometimes just saying a verse does not mean obedience is going to happen. Focusing on what not to do sometimes makes us want to sin even more. When the sinful nature is at work. Yet, we have in Jesus Christ something new and something different and something amazing and that is the Spirit of God. Now the Spirit of God in us, this is the great thing. When we hear the Word of God, the Spirit of God longs to obey. And so we have two desires at work within us. The one desire that is the sinful nature, that is like a rebel. And everything that is what you shouldn't do is the things that it fixates on. But then there's the spiritual nature. The new man in Christ, where the Holy Spirit is alive and active and he produces in us desires that when we hear the word of God, we say, I long for that. I want to be righteous. I want to do what's right. 
In Romans 8, 5, after talking about all that struggle with the sinful nature in Romans 7, um, he comes to this and, and says this in Romans 8, 5, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. And so we make a choice to live according to the Spirit. We run on His operating system. We choose to boot up with His desires and his way of doing things. Galatians 5, 6 through 17 says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so, what is the key? The key is the Word of God in the power of the Spirit. And so, we need the Word of God to combat the temptation, but we also need the strength of the Spirit to live it out. If you've been on your own trying to accomplish it in your own strength, you've probably experienced the failure and frustration. Maybe the desire to give up, give in, stop trying. But the righteous man, we're told in Proverbs, may fall seven times, but he gets back up. Seven times. You know? Get back up. Live by the power of the Spirit in the Word of God. And this is great that Jesus actually uh, points something really interesting out in John chapter 4. Maybe that seems familiar to you because that's the story of the woman at the well. The disciples go on into town. Jesus hangs out at the well. Here comes this woman who is um, a Samaritan. And through the course of their conversation, Jesus says, I can give you living water. And when his disciples come back, after he's had this conversation with this woman, who then runs back and gets all of her, her, her friends and, and neighbors to tell him, I found the Messiah. You know, he has the words of life. Um, the disciples come back and, and Jesus said to them, even though he hadn't eaten yet, that he's already eaten. And they're like, what? How can you already have eaten? Well, he answers them and said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. You know, sometimes we call the Bible our spiritual food. And in the past, you may have heard me teach, you know, it's, it's good to have the intake of the Word as food and then the outflow of doing God's will as food, you know, two sources of food in our life. But I would venture to say that perhaps what we're talking about is one meal, one thing. That the Word of God, if you're truly going to eat it as a meal... You have to actually do what it says. You can't just know what it says. Knowing is not enough. Does not Satan know what it says? He quoted it to Christ. So how do we actually consume the Word of God? We take it in and we live it out. And here's one of the great deceptions in Christianity today, I believe, is that we think that hearing a message Sunday morning is being fed. When the reality is, you taking the message and living it out is where you're going to truly be fed spiritually. I don't know, for me that made a bunch of light bulbs go on. Because maybe you've been around Bible studies and doing your own quiet times and church and everything, and, and you feel like you're starving. You feel like something's missing, something's not quite in balance. The uh, knowledge is there, but the heart's not, and I'm missing that passion, that excitement, that closeness to God. Well, could it be that we've bought into the hypocrisy lie that knowing is enough? But in reality, we could be starving 
spiritually. Because we're not applying it. We're not obeying it. I think of it like Popeye. How many of you guys watched Popeye as a kid? And that's an old one. Come on. Some of you old people. <laughs> Popeye, what a great guy. I mean, he had the biggest forearms you'd ever see on anybody. I don't know why that was thought of as being strong, but big forearms. Um, and then there's olive oil, his girlfriend, and then Brutus, the brute. And then Wimpy, of course. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> but notice every time Popeye gets in trouble, he, he's like tied up and he's hanging from a, you know, a crane or something and he's about to be eaten by sharks, whatever it is, and, and somehow his pipe turns into a blowtorch and you know, a spinach, he, he you know, uh, flexes his pectorals and squeezes that spinach can up and then opens it up and then pops it and eats it, and then all of a sudden, you know, da -da 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 -da, Popeye the Sailor Man. He busts out and he starts beating up Brutus and he's got all these superpowers. Because the spinach, the spinach. I remember watching that when I was a kid and then one time, I was in early elementary school, we were sitting at the dinner table. I don't know if my parents remember this, but we ate spinach at, that, that night for dinner. So. I took a bite of that spinach, you know, a couple bites, and I was like, yeah, and then I ran into my room and tried to pick up my bed. <laughs> it didn't work, by the way. <laughs> but I mention all that to say that having the Word of God memorized is like stocking up your pantry with spinach. It's all there, and you have to have it to know the Word. I mean, you, you should study it. You should memorize it. You should have it in your heart. And so we have it all there, so when Satan's lies come at us, we can combat it and everything else. But, you know, until we take that spinach off the shelf and take a bite, we're not actually eating it. We don't actually find the power of that spinach in the sense of the Word of God until we actually obey it. That's where the power of God meets us with the Spirit of God in an amazing way in the course of temptation. So we have to open and feed on that word. We have to obey to experience that strength. You know, David said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And next time a temptation comes, think about that verse and say, okay, um, God, what is something you've given me in your word that I can pull out right now, my spinach can, that I can pop open and live it out in this moment. Not just quote the verse, but live it out. Jesus told us in Matthew 7 that he who hears my word and obeys my word is like a man that built his house on a foundation. And I can see it's up on the screen, so I better read it. <laughs> that was Dale's international version. <laughs> okay, here it is. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Notice that. It's not just hearing the word, it's doing them. Sometimes we come away with this parable thinking, well, I believe in Jesus, my house is built on the rock. <clears throat> Satan believes that Jesus is real too. <laughs> no difference there. You know, that, that belief needs to be one of actual relying on him in faith. Trusting in Jesus to pay for your sin by placing your life in his hand. And it will be proven to be true faith when you obey that which he's asked you to do. You can't separate the two. It says, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, <coughs> think about it, in the midst of temptation, 
You know what the word says, but you don't obey it. It says, we'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great, or, and the great was the fall of it. We hear about the fall of strong spiritual men and women, and it comes down to this very thing. They know the word. But somewhere along the line, they fall into knowing the word, having the right answers, and hiding behind a spiritual facade, and their own life is eroded away as they're not obeying it in their own families, in their relationship with their husband and wife, their children, when they're all alone. You know, that's one of the greatest tests to see if, if you're obeying the word is start in the home. Start where people know you best, where you live most of your life. And assess and say, Lord, am I obeying your word in these areas? And if we're not, then man, no wonder we can't handle temptation when it comes. We're just not living it out in the most basic ways. And so... That brings us to a conclusion. You know, it wasn't enough for God to know you. He became one of us, to sympathize with us. And again, like I said, it's not enough that we know God. We need to identify with Him in a faith that is all-encompassing. We throw ourselves into his arms. Lord, save me from my sin. That faith in Jesus is where we find salvation. You know, if you've grown up knowing God's real, if you have heard that Jesus has died for your sins on the cross before, you know, it's not enough to know. Maybe this morning God is calling you. Respond. Respond by turning from that sin and turning to Him and crying out with the name of Jesus Christ. It's at His name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. It's at the confession of His name that people are saved. And so, maybe this morning is your morning. God's got your number. He's been knocking on your door and it's time to open it and receive Him and believe in Him. And that happens in your heart, in your relationship with God personally. And so if that's where you're at, I would challenge you to, in your own heart and mind, and we'll pray in a moment, to receive Him as your Savior and Lord. But maybe you've done that before and you've been a Christian for years and it's not enough to know what God's word says. We've got to obey it. And maybe we're in that place now. We're looking at our life and it's eroding back. And the wind and the waves are getting real close to our house and it's about to topple. And this morning God's got your number. And he's knocking on your door. He says, let me back in. You know, uh, I want to get right with you. And in order to do that, we, we come to him in humility and we confess our sin. Lord, forgive me for, forgive me for looking at porn. Forgive me for lusting. Forgive me for not respecting my husband, forgive me for longing for another person to fulfill my needs. Forgive me for flirting at the office. Forgive me for not reaching out, not sharing the gospel when I know I should. Forgive me for whatever it may be, for slandering somebody, for gossiping. You know, you know what it is. God knows what it is, and he's putting it on your heart right now. You know, respond to him. Get right with him. It says in Scripture, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. He'll meet you right here today. Let's respond.
right now in prayer. If you want to receive Christ for the first time, pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin on the cross. I know that you are real, but I also put my faith in you now as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life as my King. Lord, live in me and strengthen me by your Spirit to follow you each day. And Lord, also those of us who are believers, we come to you and we lay before you some maybe gross sin that has just wedged its way into our life. We pray that you pull it up. Lord, we surrender to your great hand of healing. As the great physician, you do that operation and pull it out of our lives, out of our mind. And by your spirit, that you would strengthen us to obey your word, that you would put those desires in us that like you, we can partake in the divine nature and overcome temptation when it comes our way. And Lord, if we fall, give us the strength to get back up. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. You're so faithful, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Mm -hmm.